over the past weeks, we've been sitting with Jesus on a hillside. He has been describing the kind of people through whom his kingdom flows and to whom his kingdom comes. And his description has been interesting. The, the individuals to and through whom the kingdom goes are not the people we would expect. And this morning, we're going to think about him saying from the mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee, speaking to his disciples whom he has gathered together in the midst of healing numbers of people, he took his disciples aside, had some things he wanted to communicate to them especially. And this is one of the things he said to them, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to talk about what is mercy. And JC is going to come in just a little bit and then talk about who is my neighbor. And then I'll come back up and, and close it off. What is mercy? There's a couple ways to understand mercy. Uh, one is Gentile. The other is Jewish. If you were a Jew, the world was divided into two people. There were Jews and then there were Gentiles. Gentiles was anyone, not Jewish. And historically, Gentile mercy is associated with an emotion. It's, it's roused by contact with somebody's affliction. You see somebody in desperate straits, something's happened to them, and the sense of understanding what they're going through arouses a sense of sympathy, compassion, a feeling of mercy. Um, it's psychological, it's emotional mercy. It's the way we normally think of mercy. Jewish mercy is a little bit different. Well, actually a lot different. The Hebrew concept of the word mercy is not emotional or psychological. It is legal. It's something that you do when you've bound yourself to do something. When you end up in a covenant, when you make a covenant with somebody, a covenant is an agreement where you choose to be able to offer this type of assistance and you bind yourself to doing that when somebody is in this type of need. And so when they get into that need, you do what you have promise to do, whether you feel like it or not. It's, it's not really driven by an emotion. It's not that the emotional is not present, but that you do it whether you feel like it or not. It's proper covenant behavior. So God promises to provide for those he is in covenant with and protect them. Um, when the situation arises where this is needed, the provision of those things is called mercy. So if I am a benefactor, I want to enter into covenant with you, I have things to share, and, and I promise you that if you get into situation X, I will do Y. So then say you fall into situation X. Now what I'm going to do, I might say, oh boy, you know, I said I'd do Y, I really don't feel like doing Y, but I'm going to do Y because I have made a covenant to do so. And when I come to do the thing that I tell you I'm going to do, that's called mercy. It's proper covenant behavior. It's doing what I said I was going to do. Um, so Jewish mercy is fueled by faithfulness and expressed by actions. It's not just feeling bad. Oh, I feel for you. Now, that's Gentile mercy. Jewish mercy is not just that I'm going to do something to alleviate, your, to alleviate the distress, to help you. God is not a passive victim who feels bad when uh, we are in desperate straits, but kind of his hands are tied. He doesn't stand by helplessly as his planet bleeds. There's an instance where Jesus came across somebody who had died Lazarus, you might recall the story, and Jesus got there purposefully late, and then when he approaches Mary and Martha, they had lost a brother. His family was very close to Jesus, and he learns that Lazarus has died where they laid him, and then it said Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. two words. You can memorize a verse of the Bible this morning. <laughs> Say it after me, Jesus wept. There you go. John 11.35, actually a very significant verse. What is the verse again? Jesus wept. Very significant verse. He knew what was going to happen. But his weeping, what was his weeping from? Here's what it says. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along 
with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then we come to John 11.35, which says, Jesus wept. Deeply moved means indignant. See, Jesus is weeping, but there's a, a couple of different types of emotions here. He grieves and feels sad, but it says he was deeply moved. That has more to do with indignation. And it says that he was troubled. Troubled means agitated. So Jesus is communicating a couple of things here. He is grieving, but he's pawing the ground. He's indignant. He's moved. He's agitated. It's not that he's standing by helplessly. There's nothing I can do about this. He is rolling up his sleeves, and he's going to do something to deal with death. He's going to die to deal with death. God doesn't like death. It is a portal between this world and the next, but we have to go through it. But God is not a fan of death. That's why he sent Jesus to destroy death and to bring life and immortality to light. So when Jesus faces death, it wasn't a, well, there was nothing I could do. I wish I could have done something. I feel bad. That might be Gentile mercy. It's not Jewish mercy. It's not Jesus mercy. Jesus mercy is, I feel bad, and I'm going to roll up my sleeve, and I'm going to do something about death. That's Jewish mercy. And um, it's both, yeah, so look what it says. This understanding impacts how we understand what the Bible tells us about mercy. Look what it says in James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. It's in your worship folder. I'm going to read it. You might follow along. James writes, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin, and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown. To anyone who has not been merciful, mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's talk briefly about what is happening in the churches James is writing to. Why does he speak about mercy and judgment? Here's what's going on. Look what it says. Um, Again, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism... You sin are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. What's happening is favoritism, discrimination. If somebody comes into the church meeting, and again, they didn't meet in a building, they met in a home. Uh, If somebody came in who appeared wealthy, oh, come right in. There's a seat right up front here. That's what they were doing. So if somebody comes in from the back, obviously they have gold, they they are wealthy, they have means. Um, Oh, no, 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 don't sit back. Come, please, please up here. And they're sitting them right up front, best seat in the house. If somebody comes in and they are poor, um, they sit in the back on the floor. I think you'll be able to see well enough. That's what's happening in these church meetings. Uh, It's an egregious justice because the fact is God gives grace to the person who's sitting on the floor. Um, And that's why James says, God has chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith. Uh, Jesus comes to meet the needs of the poor and the oppressed, not the only ones, but those are the ones that he especially targets, and to move them to the periphery, while those who have means are moved to the front, is an egregious injustice. And the ones the minor prophets point out as being heinous, It's in this context that James talks about faith and deeds. And this is really what he's saying about faith and deeds. Really? Really? You're going to talk about love? And this guy who has a bunch of means, you bring him right up front, and this person who is the kind of person that I've come for sits in the back, you call that faith in God? Do the right thing. Do the right thing. This guy has needs, and I give you means to be able to meet the needs. And when somebody... when a when there is 
within the community of faith, a covenant will, what is the covenant command? Love one another. Love one another. And what it says biblically, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deeds and truth. It's not just, I love you. <laughs> I hope you can see okay. <laughs> it's, what are your needs? And let's do what we can to meet one another's needs. You see the, do you see the contradiction there? Sit in the back, get out of my way, come up front, but okay, no. And that's why um, in James talks about faith and deeds, he goes, that's not love. Um, he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Wouldn't you agree this echoes what we find in the Beatitudes? It's, it says the same thing. The Beatitudes says it positively. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. There's the positive side. James flips it on its back and gives it the negative side of that. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. In the context, the absence of mercy is coupled with the presence of judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There's a couple things biblically that displace one another. You can't put them in the jar. They don't stay at the same level. Fear and love. Fear displaces love. If fear is there and you push love in, fear goes away. Fear and love displace one another. If your fear is high and your sense of God's love is low and you want that to switch, what you do is you focus on getting rid of the fear. No, what do you focus on? You focus on the love, because here's what's going to happen. They're going to displace each other. So I am looking, then I'm afraid, afraid, I'm afraid of you, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. So I'm going to look at your love, okay. Now I'm looking at your love and what's happening. Love will displace fear. Another thing where the same thing happens is mercy and judgment. If judgment is high, mercy is low. I'm not saying it might be low, it is low. Mercy and judgment displace one another. To be judgmental of self or others will get in the way of mercy. So what it says, mercy, not just a feeling though, an action. Be involved in meeting the needs of others. And you know what's going to happen as you meet the needs of others? This is what's going to happen. You're going to start to see people differently. Talk to, talk to an individual this past week who's involved with meeting the needs of those who are in desperate straits. And what he was indicating to me is it really is changing his perspective of God. Being involved in reaching out to people who are the marginalized. People who, they're not having their best life now. He indicated to me that this feels like doing the kind of things Jesus would do. And it's very interesting because this individual has been involved in this. His sense of judgment of himself and others it really is going this way, rolling up his sleeves, being involved, and he finds that he's being a little more connected with God, a little more connected with himself than with others. Why would that be? Well, because mercy triumphs over judgment, not just, I feel bad, but rolling up the sleeves, getting involved. Um, Lack of mercy is rooted in the presence of judgment. Um, this is what it says. And again, why, why does this community, why are they having trouble? This is what it says. He who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Do you know what's happening in this community? You know why judgment is high and mercy is low? Because they are throwing penalty flags at something that matters, but they think that it really is the thing. They're talking about, do you know who committed adultery here? Can we talk? Don't commit adultery. And they're throwing penalty flags that don't commit adultery, and they know who does and who doesn't because everybody's judging at one another on that basis. But because they're judging everybody on that basis, they feel, well, they feel that they are safe because they think morality triumphs over judgment. Morality triumphs over judgment. And I would never do that. I would never act that way. <laughs> but they do. 
and they believe, well, we're safe. because. But you know what the problem with that is? Does morality triumph over, triumph over judgment? Mercy does. I think there's some, going to be some moral people who are going to be very surprised when God takes out the yardstick and they say, okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, measure the adultery thing, Jesus. No way. It's not here. And Jesus is not going to measure the adultery thing. Well, that'd be one thing. He'd... How does that work? You know what he's going to measure? He's going to measure the mercy thing. You know what the deal is with that, though? Does morality count? Does morality count? Yeah. Here's my question. If you aim at morality as the thing that you will embrace as being making you near and dear to God, you know what? You might hit morality, but it's really possible to hit morality and miss and miss. That's what's happening in this community. They're throwing penalty flags on adultery and they're judgmental, but there's no mercy because they think morality triumphs over judgment. What happens if you shoot at mercy? Does morality come along behind? You are not going to abuse or use anyone that you love. My sense is you aim at morality, you could hit it, but you're not going to hit mercy. You aim at mercy, you'll end up hitting both mercy and morality, eventually. And it's God, mercy, triumphs over judgment. When judgment displaces mercy, it can be evidenced by the lack of pointing fingers. But pointing fingers isn't the only thing that gets in the way of mercy. What we're going to find, JC, come on up. Busy schedules, running around doing God things, making yourself clean for God, that can get in the way of mercy as well. Come on up, Jane. I'm seven years old, standing on the second floor of an apartment where my grandmother lived. And it's a summer day because we're only there for the summer. And I'm only there with my one little sister who's a year older, a year younger than me. Um, my littlest sister's in California. My grandmother's in the house. We're sitting on the front porch and as it is in the cool of a summer evening in Denver, on a Friday night, my grandmother would treat us to uh, this drink we call coffee milk, which really, which, which the ingredients was this. Um, one part milk, a half a part coffee, 16 parts sugar. <laughs> and we would drink with our coffee mugs that were about as big as our face smiling, acting, thinking we were the big shots sitting on the front porch. And it's about 7 o'clock and the sun's about to go down and, and my reference points, which some of you will not even understand what this is, is a phone booth. How many know what a phone booth is? <laughs> I mean, no, no, let me ask this question. How many actually stood inside a phone booth? Okay, so we got an old congregation here, man. <laughs> okay, so my reference is I'm sitting on the front porch looking towards the phone booth, and I see what I think as at a seven-and-a-half, almost eight-year-old mind. I think I'm watching a race. Two guys in the back, one guy running, the guy in the front's leading. He gets to the close to the phone booth and trips and falls. And that stumble changes everything. So I'm eight years old, seven and a half. I'm excited to see who's going to win the race, and then the guy in front stumbles and falls. And the two guys behind him don't pick him up. They start to kick and stomp him. Kick and stomp him. Kick and stomp him. 
the scene changes drastically. Now I'm seven years old. My little sister is six. The only person I can think to tell anybody is my grandmother, who's five foot, five foot when she's standing up. <laughs> when she's laying on the couch, she's 4'11". So we go in to get my grandmother. And I don't even remember if I had the words for it, but I said, Grandma, something bad's happening. So she says to me, seven years old, Jamie. Now, this is where I grew up. See, it's where I grew up, when you're seven, you know how to call the police. So you haven't even taught, some of you haven't even taught your kids that. Where I grew up, when you were seven, you knew how to call the police. So she said, Jamie, call the police. Okay. What are you going to do? Before I could ask what what's she going to do, she blasts out the door, runs down the steps, while these giant guys are kicking this kid, and gets in the middle of it. Who's your neighbor? I think they freaked out because they stopped kicking this guy and ran. Now, I'm thinking, my grandma's tough, dude. Yo. <laughs> Yo, that didn't have nothing to do with it, man. I call the police, and she says, Jamie, get some ice. So I go in, the, in our refrigerator, which we call the ice box. I go to the ice box, get a couple trays of ice, not a dispenser. Not, we, you know, we didn't have one of those kind of things. I break the ice open, put it in a, in a, in a napkin, and run outside to put ice in the sky, which looks to me like butts coming out everywhere. Who's your neighbor? Did you expect my grandmother to be the neighbor? Did I expect the guy winning the race to turn into a victim? What would you do? What would you do? I wondered that after that. For years, I wondered, what would I do if something went down and I had to step up? What would I do? I'll tell you what I did later, but I got a little something. I'm going to read this passage to you. Now, here's what I want you to imagine. Joel standing to my right, beatboxing, and Tracy's doing a little doo-wop, Okay. I recorded it in the Chambers recording studio. And let me see if I can get this to work. And, and this is how, if I knew how to hip hop, this is how I would read this verse. Here, Tracy and Joel. Jesus to the test on a quest of pious expert in the holy law expressed. Life eternal is my aim and I want to inherit. Yo, teacher, I beseech you, tell me how can I get it? Moses wrote the law for you to decode. What do you make of his mistake and the Torah moral code? Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, Leviticus chapter 19, the man replied, Love your neighbor as yourself and give God your all. Love the Lord with all your might, mind, heart, and soul. You're bang on, my son, and you've got it in one. Do this and you will live and the race will be won. But for self-validation of the Moses equation, he asked, Who is my neighbor? And here's Jesus' narration. A Jewish Joe was heading from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was jumped and mugged and the gang began to throw and hose blows to his head. They stripped Joe of his clothes, left him cold. Toes by the side of the road, a priest happened to be passing the man that was beat. He stayed clear and adhered to the far side of the street. A Levite temple helper also happened to pass by, but he too made the move to elude the fallen guy. But a despised Samaritan who was passing on through saw the man and with compassion he knew just what to do. So go into the aid of a life on the line. He dressed the wounds, soothed the bruises with oil and wine. To a hotel on his donkey, he helped the man ride where he tended to his knees and sat by his bedside next day he paid for aid for the man to stay with a couple of silver coins that's about a day's wage and for a chat he took the keeper of the inn to one side he said whatever he needs you've got to provide i'll reimburse from my purse as you nurse the lad and when i return i'll pick up the tab i ask you which of the trio was a neighbor to the man that fell into the hands of the murderous gang the one who showed him mercy and came to his aid in a word now you've heard time to go and do the same 
You hear Joel and Tracy? You never heard Joel and Tracy do that before, have you? So here's the deal. I only have a couple things to say. Mike talks about the notion of judgment. In this particular story, the context is different. An attorney comes to Jesus and asks the question. An attorney. This is court. So Jesus, who is your neighbor? And Jesus, and Jesus says some things to him. He says, teacher, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him back, what's written in the law? And then he quotes a couple scriptures. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to the lawyer, you have answered correctly. You've answered correctly correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But the attorney who had a different agenda because he's about doing things wanted to justify himself. And he says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus responds by telling a story. Now, there's a couple of things that you got to understand. The heart of the lawyer was to ask, what are the right things that I should do to get in the door with God? He's standing with God asking God that question. What are the right things to do? Wrong question. The right place to be, he should have been asking. Where is the right place to be, Jesus? And Jesus said, you stand in there, brother, with me. But he says, what's the right thing to do? Now, judgment displaces mercy in some cases. But this story is appropriate in our case because busy replaces, displaces judgment in our case. Doing and performing, honoring the code, displaces mercy as well. The story takes place and Jesus does something that's crazy. He starts to tell the story and it's actually, I, I was, I'm reading and I hear, this is sort of a typical story that a rabbi would tell. And typically, the story affirms the right people. And the story is to teach, in a metaphor, what's going on. So Jesus tells the story. And this road from Jerusalem, is it Jerusalem to Jericho, right? It's called the Bloody Road. Now, I happen to not have a problem with the Bloody Road. Why? I grew up in Five Points in Denver. And the Five Points section in Denver is the bloody road. And if you came down, I would be sending you out. Get out of here quickly. Take your Honda and move. Because I don't want any of y'all to get hurt. Right? The bloody road. Some, of, some folks are equipped to walk the road, and some people shouldn't be walking that road. And so when Jesus put the context on that road, people knew, oh, man. And then he invites three characters to show up. The first two characters should have been the hero. They should have done the right thing. <laughs> but one crosses the street and acts like he don't see nothing. The other one ignores. And then Jesus does something really crazy. Last week I talked about the Samaritan. Now, I might have, I hope... In my attempt to make the point, I didn't offend you, but if I offended you, I'm okay with that. I'm going to be honest with you. That if I use the N-word and some of you are offended, I feel the love for me. I get, I get it. You, lo you love me. But I'm not, I don't care about me right now. I'm trying to make a point of the difference of what's going on. 
So that same character shows up in the story. When he says the Samaritan, people say, oh, no, he didn't. No, he didn't just use him. It would be like me saying Osama bin Laden showed up in the heroic position. Oh, no, you didn't just use that dude. No, you didn't. And then he proceeds to say, this guy does all these things. If you count the list, there are six behaviors that are merciful that the Samaritan performs. And the truth is, the money that he dropped at the hotel would have provided completely for the wounded guy for three weeks. For three weeks, he would have been taken care of. So he didn't drop a couple of nickels with this dude and say, well, you know, if it gets sketchy, here's a couple extra pennies. He said, hey, man, if this dude is sick for a while, I got him. I got him. And if it runs out after three weeks, I'll settle up. Now, my question is this. Simply put, who is that? Jesus then asked, who is the good? See, if my motive is to do the shoulds, then my attempt to do the code will displace my response to do what God wants. Did you hear what I said? The attempt to do the code will go against responding with your heart. Remember, the attempt to do the code is fear-based, I think. How do I keep my spot, get what I have and keep my spot? But blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. I think it's also the, the flip of that. Blessed are the mercy. Blessed are the people who can do mercy because they have received mercy, and the mercy they got, they give. The mercy comes from having connection. I'm down because I've been the beggar that's been beat up. And he, and he took care of me. And the love that I received, the merciful love that I received in the caring for my wounds, now I can't look. I can't look at my man. I can't look at Gary. I can't look at Marsha wounded and go, man, it sucks to be them. Can't do it. I can't cross the street anymore. Not because I'm driven by doing the right thing, but because the compassion that surpasses understanding has touched my heart in a person of Christ and in the the person of the Father. And that compassion has changed my perspective on who you guys are. And interesting enough, That compassion has changed my perspective, not on who you are as friendlies, but even the people who are enemies. I look at them, and now, weirdly enough, they act goofy, and I go, oh, man, man, that dude needs some love, man. That that, that dude don't need judgment. He needs love. How, How do we figure out to love this guy? Now, love looks different depending on the case, how I love looks different. But when I've been loved by the Father, and I'm able to love, because if I'm, I view myself as crooked, then I can look at crooked a different way. If I view myself as righteous, then the only view I can look at is either through the doing the do's or through judgment. That's the only way I can look. Because anything else threatens me. Anything else threatens me. So, the challenge is this. Jesus asked the question, and I'll finish here. Who is your neighbor? I'm asking you this. Let your relationship with the Father surprise you. Because you may be finding yourself to be a neighbor in a crazy context. Or you might find out that you have to neighbor somebody you don't like. 
And God's going to call you to extend love, mercy. They don't get what they deserve. Amen? Just one word of application before we close. Um, how do we, so what do we do? We're talking about what mercy is, and I think you have a picture of what it looks like, what it does. So how might we move towards having a greater capacity to roll up our sleeve and not just feel bad, but to do something? I heard it said once, whatever captures your mind captures your heart, becomes your true objective. Whatever captures your mind captures your heart, becomes your true objective. I'm going to say that again. Whatever captures your mind captures your heart and becomes your true objective. So here's my question. What captures your mind? Mercy or judgment? Mercy begets mercy and judgment begets judgment. What captures your mind? Whatever captures your mind captures your heart becomes your true objective. Sometimes we grab onto judgment because we want to keep ourselves in line. And you can keep yourself in line with judgment. But you just don't end up as mercy. And that's ultimately the way he's going to measure us. You say, okay, Mike, what could I do? Okay. If you wanted to, remember when we talked about what mercy was? Mercy is more commitment as from God's perspective than commandment. Would you agree? Commitment closer to mercy or judgment? Commitment closer to mercy or judgment? It's commitment. God's commitment to us. His active, I'm going to do this. Is that a reflection of mercy? Okay, it's a reflection of mercy. How about commandment? And there are commandments. Is that a reflection of mercy or judgment? Okay, so if you want to become more merciful, what do you want to make more room in your mind for? Commandments or commitments? What are you making more room in your mind for? His commitments or his commandments? Whatever captures your mind captures your heart. It becomes your true objective. Make more room for his commitments. And you know what, you, you know what you'll end up doing? You know what's funny? You'll end up doing his commandments as well. Because when you shoot at mercy, love comes along behind. Remember the eclipse? Did anybody catch the solar eclipse on Thursday? Got kind of golden outside. Here's a picture. Let commitments eclipse commandments. Let commitments eclipse commandments. And things become golden. When commandments eclipse commitments, you can be moral, but you won't end up being merciful. And that is what he's going to judge. Joe, come on up. We'll have a closing song. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, thanks for causing your will to be recorded clearly, for sending your word in flesh and blood so that you would communicate in three dimensions and in historical time. And you've let us know that the merciful are blessed. The merciful will be shown mercy. That's your character. You make commitments to us. As we make room in our mind for those commitments, we feel, we sense, we believe in your mercy. That even in difficult times, that you will provide and protect. It creates a sense of security, a calmness. The reality of your mercy seeps down into our mind secures us, anchors us, and allows us to explore those who need mercy. We find ourselves extending mercy. What we receive, we extend. That's the way Jesus lived. I pray that we'd be more like him. In his name, amen.